Hello, you're with Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. I'm Karen McCarthy. In the programme today, safeguarding share milkers' progression to farm ownership. Once a given, it can be a rocky path these days in the dairy industry. The ultimate rural challenge, the Young Farmer of the Year contest, taken out this year by a Murchison vet. What's required of our young farmers nowadays and what new skills are they bringing to the sector? And the extravaganza that was National Field Days, musings on this year's myriad offerings at Mystery Creek. My guest this week, Tim's dairy farmer, Karen Tully, who's chairman of Federated Farmers' share milker section, and all the way from Canterbury, Hilary Phillips, the operations manager of New Zealand Young Farmers. Welcome to the studio. Hi. Welcome. Let's kick off with Young Farmer of the Year, grand final winner, Michael Lilly, a young vet from Murchison. We haven't managed to get him in here yet. I'd like to. Tell us about him. Yeah, he's great. He's, he's from the Tapawera Young Farmers Club and he's, this was his second go in the contest and I think the first time he entered he uh, placed seventh. So he took it out this year and uh, it was really, really much a team effort with him and his wife. Um, and he's just going to be a fantastic ambassador for the contest. What gave him the edge? I think uh, what gave him the edge is that he had been there, through there before. So he'd, he'd had a go before and placed last. And so he knew what he needed to work on and he really identified his weaknesses and really studied hard uh, and really put a lot of effort into it. Tell us a yeah. bit about the contest because I know it's intense. You've got seven, I think, regional finalists yeah. thrown together. Yeah, yeah, it is really, really intense. So, yeah, at, at that level, grand final level, there's uh, yeah, all sorts of competitiveness comes out of the contestants. It's uh, over three days, so there is the technical day, whereas um, this year they had the setting of you've... Uh, got down to business on the farm, you decide to do some book work and all of a sudden you get a call from the bank manager who wants to rock on up and spend some time with you and the stock agent and plus also your normal farm work. So it was really challenged them, you know, you set up and decide what you're going to do for the day and then it just all, all your plans go out the window with all these um, consultants and things that, you know, call in and want to spend time with you. So it really, really challenged them. Kieran's smiling and nodding. Does that sound like a, a familiar scenario? It does, and usually the more planning you do, the worse it becomes when people turn up and phone up. Yeah. You, you must have observed the Young Farmer of the Year contest over, over the years, have you? We have, yeah, and, and certainly um, it's nice to see a competition have such kudos in, in New Zealand. You know, in England it's... It's quite popular, but uh, it's not the same level as it is in New Zealand. It's quite an institution mm. in New Zealand. I think even townies know about it. Yeah, yeah. I think 50% um, of all um, New Zealanders have watched the contest on TV, which is just fantastic. It's really great. Now, I yeah. know you've been in competition. You and, and Sarah, your wife, you're, you're uh, dairy farming, aren't you, at Natia in the yep. Hauraki Plains? You were um, Auckland Hauraki Share Milkers of the Year a, a few years back. Yeah, about four years ago. Big uh, contest? Huge, actually. A lot of work required. Uh, probably more sp focused on a specialised field rather than the general that uh, Young Farmers competition is. But it was a lot of work, but we learned a lot about ourselves and our business and it gave us some great opportunities in growing our business as well. Such as what? What did you learn? A couple of, couple um, of the key, key things you took away from the contest? Probably for Sarah and I, it was our financial management and forward planning. And once we'd identified those in our second year of entering, uh, we managed to improve on those immensely. And the opportunity came up as a result of the work we did to, to purchase our first farm. And what is it like pitting yourself against against others? I mean, it's one thing to sort of to do the job, but but to to put yourself on the line and, and you know see how you go against some pretty stiff competition. What what makes you do that? It, it, you must be mad, actually. <laughs> I think <laughs> uh, it, it's. I guess we wanted to benchmark ourselves uh, and. It's all about getting your name out there in terms of finding the right opportunities for yourself. And if you're going to want to be put on the top of the pile for a job list, um, you need to upskill yourself as best you can. And we found the uh, Dairy Awards was a great way, uh, and it's a great way on all levels, whether you're a manager or a, a share milker or whatever, or a trainee, to, to find about the best parts that you need to improve on to, to drive yourself forward. Mm. And the contest is really similar to that as well. Um, exactly what Karen said, it's... It's putting your name out there as, as the best in, in your field and you also identify your weaknesses and in terms of the contest, the contestants study for so much, it'll be like that with the shimmer because yeah. you study for so much, even if you don't utilise that knowledge, you're just such a um, more well-rounded person, you just learn so much from studying and preparing for that event. Just from yeah. going through the process. Absolutely, yeah. Whether you make it to the grand final or not. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it still the p uh, pinnacle? I know it's a marquee event in the rural calendar. Um, is it still um, 
as I say, um, a, a really sought after title. Absolutely. These guys, you know, we see them now with, we've got agri kids and teenage coming through and agri kids are um, primary school age and they just idolise those guys that are at grand final and they just, they really want to be the young farm champion. Is that like they're yeah. rock stars? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. We had their grand finalists, they had uh, breakfast with the contestants on the Saturday of grand final and, and they were, they were just there, they're rock stars. And, yeah. and tell me about the, the younger ones, because young farmers, you've got to enter the competition, you've got to be between what age? Yeah, 15 to 31, so a member of young farmers. Right, yeah. and so these younger ones, how, how young are they, the ones that are in the so teen kids and the, and the yeah, ag kids? Yeah, kids are primary school age and teen ag is secondary school age. So they have their own wee competitions at the regional finals and at grand final, and it's just prepping them through. And uh, it's, they're really getting that enthusiasm and passion for agriculture, which is fantastic, because in schools, agriculture isn't really promoted. It's not promoted to our intelligent students. It's promoted as sort of your, your cop-out career, I guess, which is not the way it is. I mean, we know that agriculture, mm. you've, got to be, you've got to be the best at so many different things, and we want those best people coming through. You've got young kids of your own, Karen. I mean, is it something you, you see them following in your footsteps? I think it'd be nice if one of them did, but at the moment mm. we're just probably more focused on giving them some skills to make decisions and, and learn how to manage themselves properly. And, and in that way, we hope that we can teach them to apply themselves to anything they want to rather than just be specific in farming. But, I mean, it, it would be nice. Mm. What are some of the challenges? Because it's a, it's a mix of physical, practical and academic, isn't it? I've got here Agri yeah. Skills Challenge, Test of Practical Know-How, Agri Sports uh, agri business. I mean, how big an element is that of being a young farmer of the year winner? It's, it's huge because you need to be uh, able to manage your own business. And an orator, we have uh, speaking competition. Of, you know, speaking as part of it. Also, they prepare a presentation prior to the final, and they present that as well. And there's also a, a newish segment called the community footprint, which is identifying uh, what footprint they would leave if they were taken out of their community. So we're really looking for a, a nice community person, someone who has a smart business head on them, but also has those practical skills and the, the ability to cope under pressure as well. That business head, Karen, I imagine, I mean, you, you, you'd know that's a really essential part of being a farmer these days and the contest yeah. isn't all about, you know, build me an electric fence yeah. and get your gumboots on and shear a sheep. There's a lot more to being a farmer, a young farmer. That's right and I think these days with the competition for jobs and positions so high you really do need to have that skill set and that somebody told me once in terms of budgeting, if it's not your budget it's not your business. So they've yeah. really got to have a head for business Absolutely. as well as a love of the land and a desire to, to make that work. Yeah. How would you rate yourself in one of these competitions, Karen? <laughs> you're, not, you're not such a young farmer anymore, but um, when you look at what's an exception. <laughs> when you look at what's thrown at them in terms of the challenges and, and, and things, you know, it, it's it's a big ask, isn't it? It's it's huge, and, and I'm in awe of the competition mm. for the the well-roundedness that you describe. Certainly, the uh, dairy industry awards it's purely focused on dairy. Um, but there's a tremendous range of things you have to be prepared to be able to do in the Young Farmer competition. And uh, yeah, anybody who wins that title or even reaches regional winner level uh, is mm. a, a very good person, well-rounded, and um, yeah, hold them up in the highest of esteem. Yeah. Well, congratulations to Michael Lillian. I must mention Catherine Tucker, I guess, from the yeah. Kuiper in the far north. Yeah. Significant because? Yeah, um, first female in about eight years, I think, but she's a th the, only the third female to make grand final, and she's a tiny wee thing. But she's strong. I've never seen, I know at the, her regional final where she won, the way she handled a chainsaw, I just, I've never seen any man handle it like that. <laughs> she's just a real natural and she's a real strong, determined girl and she, she was great for the contest. Coming up, the changing face of farming and the different models of land ownership in New Zealand. With the evolution of the dairy industry, what's a share milker to do? I'm Karen McCarthy and you're back with Straight Talk and our guest this week Hilary Phillips from New Zealand Young Farmers and Karen Tully, the Federated Farmers Share Milkers Section Chairman. Let's talk share milking, that's what we've hauled you in for today. A route into farm ownership for many a young farmer over the years, yet it's an industry on the slide in decline. Now I've read it's shrunk, the number of share milkers has shrunk by a third in the last decade, is that right? That's right, Karen, but also there's been a corresponding drop-off in the number of farms as well as farms have amalgamated and got bigger. Is that the problem, that people are, are aggregating, farmers are buying the neighbours? 
they don't need so many shea milkers anymore. It is to a degree, but in context, the shea milking industry has always accounted for about a third of the industry, so two-thirds exist quite happily without shea milkers. So as a shea milker section, we were just concerned about the percentage of shea milking jobs that had declined, and we initiated a progression study to get a snapshot of the industry and, and see where we could go to from here. Tell me about this report, because I think it was presented at the recent Shear Milkers uh, Federated Farmers Conference in Hamilton. It must have been a big talking point. It was actually, and to be honest, there were no new surprises in uh, how the industry was, but it was nice to get things written down. We, we found that the number of herd owning positions has dropped and people have taken on more variable order share milkers and contract milkers. And there's a number of reasons behind that. The, the main one really is uh, probably bank debt. Farmers have been in a position where they can't employ a share milker because they need the, more of the money for debt repayment, if you like. Uh, increased corporatisation of farms. There are some farms that, that choose a manager structure and, and some of the you know, profits from the, that return to their shareholders as opposed to a, a part of a cheque for a share milker. Now you, you started out as a, a share milker, did, did you, when you came to New Zealand. What was your path? Because I know you came, obviously you're not New Zealand born, I think you're from the north of England. Mm. You came out here 10, 11 years uh, ago? We came here about 18 years ago 18 now. years yeah. ago, okay. And we worked on wages and we literally did what the, the Kiwi progression plan was. You got on wages, put some money together, bought a herd. And eventually, um, 2008, when, when cow prices were really high, we managed to transfer that value into land. And then watch all our assets disappear mm -hmm. very quickly after that. Uh, so there is a risk there in share milking. And I guess that's, that's part of the, the progression study as well. Share milkers have had traditionally a higher return on their investment, um, but they need to really because they've got the volatility of cow prices, um, which go up and down a lot quicker than land values. You're, you're nodding. Were there any share milkers mm. in the contest, I'm just wondering? Or? I don't think there don't were know. any share milkers this year. Um, certainly a lot of dairy guys, a lot of dairy guys within young farmers as well. Uh, and mm. a lot of them would, would, would I imagine be going down this path? They are, they are. Yeah, they're looking at equity partnership and then getting through into share milking and yeah, it's, it's, it's tough out there, it really is. Yeah. It uh, is, and one of the comments on equity partnerships too, it's a relatively new vehicle in New Zealand and there's not a lot of evidence about it yet, but we came up with a phrase in Canterbury called the golden handcuffs and that's where you can make enough money to buy into a block of land uh, and maybe milk cows on it, but it's, you don't make enough return to increase your piece of the pie. And that, that was a concern that we, we're mm. looking to see what happens in the future with that. But now we're aware of what we can monitor it a bit better. Have you heard that phrase? It's no, no, I haven't. No, no. Mm. But, but d d does that make sense to you that there are people yeah. that kind of get stuck? They do, they absolutely do. And it's really important for young guys and girls to be able to see a way forward to where they want to get into that farm ownership. But, but sometimes it's just, it's really hard and they just they can't see a way forward and they leave the industry, which is really sad. Because I imagine for most young farmers that is their dream, isn't it? They, they don't want to be working for someone else, they want their own land, they yeah. want their own farm. You ask anyone, even you know, young kids, you know, what's your goal? I want to own a piece of land, you know, I want to own my own farm. But you, know, you, you don't just inherit farms like you used to and uh, try, trying to get into it, it's, just, it's incredibly difficult. Mm. We did some modelling on people who had a waged career and worked through the management system on farms uh, versus somebody that goes through lower order share milking and purchasing their own cows. And over a 15 year period, using quite conservative figures, there was a million dollar difference in the a equity accumulated. Bucks. And if you're buying a farm, you know, you've still got to come up with that extra million somehow, yeah. which is how we're going to have to train people to think a little bit outside the square in order to do that. And that was over, what, about a 10 or 15 year yeah. period? Mm. So basically staying on wages is not a good option? No, it, it, I, I, I'll go on the record as saying if you stay on wages you probably won't buy your own farm. Mm. Do you think young people out there, young share milkers, re realise that? Or people that would be going down that path re realise that that's a, that's a huge difference, isn't it? Mm. I, I think some of them do. Um, what we found though is 90 people might apply for one share milking job. And one of the highlights of the progression report was for people to upskill themselves so they could learn how to be better business people, probably enter competitions mm. like Young Farmer and Dairy Industry mm. Awards to get better skills so that when the CVs come through the letterbox, uh, they're on the top of the pile rather than somewhere in the middle. Mm. And that's where both competitions, you know, it gets that name out there. If you've got a pile of 90 CVs and uh, top of the pile is Karen Tully, a name that you know, you know, that you look at him uh, upon him more favourably for that role. It sounds yeah. tough that you've got to get out there and really market yourself or sell yourself and get all that, that skill set together. As I say, it must be a lot harder to be a young farmer these days than it was 40, 50 years ago. Mm. Definitely. And I think at the end of the day, it's, it's where the rubber meets the road and you have to decide if you really want this farm or you really want your own herd of cows. There's certain things you have to do and certain things you have to give up. 
um, in order to put the money together to do it. Um, you know, people in the dairy wards and young farmers have, have sacrificed time away from their family um, to, to learn how to do things better and also maybe for on the odd holiday so that they can put it into cows or land. When you came to New Zealand, I mean, how, how strong was that dream or desire for you and your wife to, to have a farm, to sort of get there to, to majority ownership? You know, it's still a dream, is it? It is. We're, we're minority partners at the moment, but we have um, got the scope to increase our share as we go on. But it was just a burn. We had to come to New Zealand. We had no plan B. And the reason we came here was because um, it was a system, the share milking system was recognised around the world, and we couldn't see any other country that would facilitate that for us. We were prepared to work hard. And, and leave our families behind to uh, to come and do it. And no regrets? Mm. Absolutely none. You talk to my wife Sarah, she still says she's on holiday. <laughs> 18 <laughs> years after arriving here. That's great to hear. Mm. As you say, it's, it's, it's an institution, isn't it? That's a thing, share milking, and, 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 and it's something we should be very proud of, and, and it's important to protect and, and safeguard into the future. It, it is, and I think if you look at recent entries in the share milk of the year competition in particular, the current holder is an Irishman. Uh, two years ago, it was a South African. When, when we were runner-up, you know, we're from overseas as well. And I really don't think that New Zealanders realise how good this system is. And, and you know, if, if you work it, it'll work for you. Mm. What if we don't safeguard this traditional pathway to farm ownership? You know, what, what's going to happen to all those young would-be farmers out there? How do, how do they get out of this poke? I think it's a case of upskilling themselves. There'll still be plenty of people who do take on share milkers because they've been share milkers themselves in the past. Uh, but I think there's also other options such as uh, buying cows and leasing them out to farm owners so you can increase your equity that way. Uh, various things like property uh, and just learning about other markets and other uh, investment opportunities that are there. Again, it's that business bent, isn't it? It's that Absolutely. thing that's so important. Absolutely. And it's just you've got to be able to, to think of your farm like a business and, and not think so much with your heart. You've got to think with your head. And the young farmers that you see, that you've mm. seen over the, all the years, you've been associated with young farmers, do they have that? Do they understand that's a crucial part of being a farmer? They do, and you find that the successful young farmers and the successful uh, people in the contest are the ones that do have that really good business head on them. Yeah, they're not just all about that physical on the farm work, but they think of it like a business and they can really apply their thinking and not just get... get uh, caught in that um, wanting to do something because they want to do it. It's, it's got to be right. It's got to be a smart decision. And it's got to be a decision based on, on their futures. Their... It's all, yeah, all about the numbers and things and, yeah, and trying to secure that farm for themselves and for their family because a lot of them have got young families as well, like here. Yeah. Playing the long game, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Much more in store for you after the break, including in between the grand finals, keeping young farmers relevant and thriving in its 80th anniversary year. Welcome back to Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. We're with Karen Tully and Hilary Phillips. Hilary, you're not a farmer, but you've been involved with young farmers for, for years. It's not a prereq, which may come as a surprise to some people. Yeah, it probably does, yeah. I mean, I was um, born and raised on a farm. But I think uh, one of the, the fantastic things about young farmers is that it's someone, anyone from rural life. And if you've got that passion for the rural outlook and the rural life, and, you, you know, that... Young Farmers is great for everybody. All comers welcome. Yeah, and one of the other great things about Young Farmers is it's just it's that, that mindset, everyone's um, mm. on the same page, it's just the type of people and we have a wee motto at the moment, real people, real experiences, making a difference and it just encompasses exactly what Young Farmers is all about. It's and all about the people and the experiences. And how do you go about keeping it relevant and thriving? There's so many other distractions this day and age and other things to do. How do you keep that organisation thriving? It, it is a real struggle. Uh, there's so many um, competitive things out there for people's time. People are working lots of longer hours. There's um, technology, um, the competition from that as well. So we're constantly trying to evolve um, with the bringing in the agri kids and the teen ag, getting them interested in agriculture at a young age, realizing that hey, you can uh, I guess satisfy that technology bug inside you without playing PlayStation. You can apply that to agriculture as well. Now, does Young Farmers work closely with with federated farmers? I just don't know what the sort of tie in is, if any, with you, with you guys, Karen. I mean, do you do you think you you guys can have a closer relationship? I, I definitely think so. We we can see a lot of fresh people, vibrant people, enthusiastic people in the industry and young farmers and when they get to 31 they can disappear into cyberspace 
and we're keen, um, you know, federated farmers is, is traditionally your older politician type people. And if you have a herd of cows and you don't replace your, your cows each year, mm. um, your herd gets older and stagnant and less productive. And it's no different with organisations of people. And federated farmers needs to f find more ways of working with organisations such as young farmers um, to, you know, if, like get some new replacements for the herd. Yeah. Some new blood. Yeah. And we, we, young farmers have a long history with federated farmers, but one of the things that we find is our members, when they get to 31 and they're looking to go to feds, is that it's, uh, I guess, quite stagnant. And, uh, is it a bit of an of old set, boys club? Yeah, it is a little bit. I think younger people find it kind of hard to, to sort of um, become included in that. Mm. And that's where we'd really like, I guess, feds to kind of freshen up a little bit and... Um, if you want young, you know, young people involved, just to sort of loosen up the structure and and be kind of welcoming and open to new new ideas and new ways of doing things. It might not yeah. be the reality, but it is the perception yeah. that it's a bit of a what a stuffy organisation. It can be, and, and different different provinces have different relationships with different sure. people. I know mm. certainly in the in the Manawatu, two, um, feds and young farmers have great relationship there. Um, but how, it, how are things yeah. in Waikato Hauraki Plains? I don't know uh, your experience. Hauraki's got a great organisation after a few years of um, inactivity, if you like, and feds and young farmers had a, a successful quiz night the other night. Um, so, you know, th it's building ties on a local level, but also following it through to national level. And there are certainly different regions around the country um, that have a more enthusiastic bunch of people than others. But you put young yeah. farmers in a room, you've got fun. Yeah. <laughs> so you're actively recruiting anyone out there? Yeah. Sign Absolutely. up. Yeah. And as you say, you don't have to be a farmer. It's 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 much more than a it, it's a social organisation, but much more than that. With young farmers, yeah. But I think with with feeds, you know, it's those the really keen the the farmers of young farmers that are the ones that are the, the appropriate people to go through into feeds. Yeah. Now I know at field days young farmers had, had a site, I don't think you were there yourself. Yeah, no I wasn't there, but yeah we did have a site, yeah. Flying and the flag and what, pr promoting and yeah, recruiting? Yeah, absolutely, just flying the flag for young farmers. Um, we have a new initiative which is sort of getting out, out there at the moment called PICA, which is the Primary Industry Capability Alliance, and that's where we're working quite closely with Feds with that and Lincoln and Massey University, and that's just creating that pathway for people through young farmers and then um, the rural business network, which we call RBN, and through um, into the mature workforce as well. Just the support systems around there, like Feds provides great support systems for, for farmers and young farmers does and um, for the younger workforce as well, and really uh, banding together quite well. So when people come in, particularly people from overseas and young people into the industry, they don't feel as though they're on their own and they can find the support mechanisms and the training to help them um, achieve their goals on farm. You were at field days, did you see the site or sort of yeah, run I did into any actually. of these people? Yeah, yeah, I did and it's good you can see young farmers evident all around the, um, the field days and it's good to see young people out there and, and feds had a presence there as well and pick up on what Hillary says, you know, it's fun and exciting being a young farmer in feds, it's, it's no fun talking about rates reductions <laughs> or some of the political stuff we have to put up with and it, I guess it's just trying to get the message across of the value of federated farmers and we, we do do a lot of work behind the scenes, mm, a, a lot of it not lauded because it's better to uh, just have quiet discussions with people, mm. land and water forums one issue, but there needs to be more engagement with young farmers so they can see the value of, of moving on to federated farmers and bringing the skills they've learned in young farmers and through the competition as an example, bringing it through into federated farmers. I actually think um, in some ways when young farmers get to 31 and, and the, you know, their time's sort of up, it's perhaps a little bit early for feds. They still haven't switched on that, that um, bigger picture thinking, um, where, where that's the fed strength. I think maybe, yeah, it's just that little wee gap, age gap in the middle. Mm. Yeah. You almost need something like a young feds or something like that, and the same yeah. as some political parties have their sort of training like ground. Like the young yeah. that yeah. kind yeah. of thing. I was mm. going to say, is there maybe a gap that needs filling there, mm. a new yeah, sort well, of organisation? Yeah, I guess in a way that is being filled. And have you heard of the Rural Business Network? Yeah. Yeah, so the RBN, which has been set up by young farmers, which covers, kind of caters for that, that older young farmers age group, sort of, I guess, from the 27 plus. And, and maybe that does kind of bridge that gap with feds, just a little bit, that age gap, yeah. It's interesting, maybe there's something for somebody could pick up the cudgels and, uh, as you say, <laughs> young feds, it's got a nice ring to it, doesn't mm. it? Mm. Yeah. Well, listen, it's nice to hear that you, your two organisations are working together. I mean, one needs the other, clearly. Absolutely. You can't go it alone. This, you grow the, the young farmers of the future, and then you guys take them and, and see them through. 
Yeah. Yeah. Did you have anything to do with young farmers when you first arrived in New Zealand? No, because I was already too old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I keep talking about your age. <laughs> I, I was involved in England and yeah, um, yeah lots of oh, fun, really? lots of skills, yeah. and it, it was fantastic experience for young people in the countryside. Right. English young farmers is fantastic. I went over there on exchange, and it's just. It's just massive, and the passion over there. And did you ever go to a national conference? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's I'm going to leave you guys to talk. <laughs> Maybe talk about setting up the young feds. You've been watching Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. Thanks to my guests, Karen Tully and Hilary Phillips, and as always to you at home for watching. If you'd like to get in touch, check out our Country 99 TV website. I'm Karen McCarthy. See you next time for more Straight Talk.